yet to come. My God, something got a hold of me. Maybe I'll just preach on that this morning. Something got a hold of me. Again, listening to the good old song that Reverend James Cleveland song and when he got to that track, something got a hold of me. Something just got excited in me. And I just began to smile and I just began to talk with the Lord and he began to talk with me. So let us get into <laughs> the word of God. We're going to Revelation chapter number two. We'll start at verse 11. Revelation chapter number two. We'll start at verse 11. Again, welcome to the house of the Lord. Welcome to the presence of the Lord. Glad that you're here and it is my prayer that you will be open and receptive to just let God have his way in your life. Mine, 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 mine. I'm lingering here and I just feel and sense God's presence wants to move. So I'm going to be obedient and I'm not going to fight it. I'm just going to get out the way. Revelation chapter number two will start at verse 11 and it reads thus. Again, it says, he that has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the church. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. To the angel of the church at Pergamos write these things. Said he which hath the sharp, sharp two-edged sword. It is important that we understand the symbolism of uh, words that we read here in the book of Revelation. A sword in scripture, it points to judgment. Amen. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Verse 13, it says, I know thy works and where thou dwellest even where Satan's seat is. And thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you where Satan dwelt. So the church finds themselves in a very, in a stronghold, if you will, and they're being faithful and they're being commended for their faithfulness to scripture, underscore and underline this gentleman by the name of Antipas. He was asked to compromise and he was asked to acquiesce to some of the things that they were doing. And he decided that he is going to stand up for God and whatever comes my way, so be it because this too will pass. If you kill me for standing up for my faith, you're doing me a favor. Why? Because I'm going home with the Lord. You see, when we live with a sense of purpose and we understand what the end is, nothing that they say or threaten you with is of any concern to you. Because if, if, if it's not now, it is later. And if you help me to go see my Lord and my Savior, I can sit and rest with him and I can talk with him. Verse 14, it says... But I have a few things against thee. So you did good and you're applauded for the good that you did. But nonetheless, as we talked about last week, where, you know, you sit and you have your one in one with your manager, they sit and they highlight the good that you do. But the areas of concerns, if you will, they will point it out and say, if you begin to make modification and change and implement these things, then you will have a successful rest of the year. It is up to you uh, what you do with the information that is then exchanged in that one and one Verse 14, it says, but I have a few things against you because thou as there them that hold the doctrine of Baal, who taught Balak and cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat sacrifice unto idols and to commit fornication. So the church is doing good on one hand. However, on this hand, there are some areas of concern. The Lord is pointing it out to them. It goes on here in 15. It says, so as thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Remember, we talked about the doctrine of the Nicolaitans and how that traps and how that prevent and how that reduce, it compromises, it contaminate. My God, it does so much to the life of a believer. Again, it says here in 15, so thou ask also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans ladians which things i hate the bible also talks about seven things that god hates if he leads me to go there we'll talk about them but in spite of the fact that the lord is having this conversation with the church of pergamos he underscore and underlined the good the areas of concern he brings to them he is not saying because you have done these that is it the lord now presents 
my God, an opportunity for the church to turn, my God, and to be strengthened. And I will talk about this in a few. It says now in 16, repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. So it is judgment that he will come with. And when the Lord comes to preside, there is no, well, what had happened was, no, he is just going to sit. And the things that you did, he's going to have a conversation with you. Remember this again, if you hear nothing else, everything that we do in this world and in this life, everything that we say, we are going to have to give an account for it. There is coming a time when we leave planet earth and we go to be with our Lord. We're going to have two conversations when we meet him. We're going to talk about the things that we did here in this life. And then he's going to ask you, he's going to ask you, did you do everything that I asked you? to do? Did you follow my precepts? Did you go in all the words and preach the gospel? Did you do everything? So I want to prepare you for the conversation that we're going to have, not only now, but I want us to think about our tomorrow. It's not about only today. You see, the challenge with us as Christians, we're only living for today and what is on our plate, but there is greater that God is calling us to. And as long as our focus, as long as I have a myopic view on life and I'm just looking at what is before me and I don't hold my head up and take the blinders off to see my peripheral understanding that God is truly calling me to greater and there is greatness inside of me, I will continue to miss the mark and I want to make sure that I do everything everything that God has asked me to do in preparing you and provoking you and annoying you to get to that place where you need to get to. I am where I am because you see, they weren't easy with me. The mothers and the fathers of old, they weren't easy. They used to get on my nerve and I used to tell them, leave me alone. And they used to tell me, I can't do that. I don't get an option. I don't get a choice in this. And I want to make sure the very same thing that they did for me, I do it for you so you can understand your value in God and you don't allow just about anything to come into your life and your space and to reduce and to minimize, to contaminate who you are as a child of God, the word of God has been read, spirit of the living God. We come before you, God, and we pause and we wait. Father, we say, have your way. Clear the air, O oh God, in our homes, in our hearts, and in our minds. And I pray, O oh God, for the time that you have allotted, spirit of the living God, let the Holy Spirit Ah, God, be the bridge between the words that I speak and let the words that you speak through me be like a conveyor belt in that we are connected to the conveyor belt and that which you put on there, God, it will enter into our hearts and it will change our lives for the better. Father, we come and we thank you for the examples that God are written in scripture. We read it and when we do the word of God, read us. And when we find that the word of God begins to read us where there are gaps and things that are missing, the Holy Spirit brings it to our attention. One, so we can do something about it. And two, we can have a conversation with you. And then three, we can implement the things that, oh God, you're instructing us to do. And then four, those who know of the things or the areas or the gaps that we're missing in our lives, they will see uh, 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 the changes. And then five, oh God, it provokes a conversation where they ask, how is it that you're no longer this way or that way? This then, oh God, provides the opportunity for us to share of your goodness, your grace, and your mercy, and that which you have done. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh upon us. Be with us for the time that you have allotted. We look to you and we say thank you. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. I want to begin as a follow-up to a conversation that we had last week about the Church of Smyrna. We talked about the Church of Smyrna, some of the challenges that the church at Smyrna uh, faced. And there was a, 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 an expression that the Lord used in order to help us to understand uh, uh, the importance of a relationship with him. That expression that he used was, you know, building equity in him. And we talked about that briefly. And when I concluded service, he just brought something back to my mind. And he said, when you begin, just 
begin at this point and just connect the dots, we will understand the church at Smyrna and the church of Pergamos, they faced the same challenge. They were in close proximity. So the seat of the sons of Satan, they were dealing with the same issue. And not only were they dealing with it, the same issue, we find that the outcome was similar but different. But we want to go back for a quick moment here and talk about building equity in the Lord. And he said, just bring this to your attention. Think about the neighborhood that you live in. Think about a particular home in your neighborhood. When you drive by that particular home, you are in awe because of how things are well put together and things are well kept. And because of that, that helps you, my God, and your property value. And he said, let's go to the other extreme. Think about a home in your neighborhood Think about that home that is not well cared for. In fact, I had a friend who lived in Massachusetts, and when we were in Massachusetts, one of the complaints that she had is that she had this neighbor that was adjacent to her home, and uh, she would complain because she said <laughs> the back of the home kind of looked like Sanford and Son. Remember that TV show, Sanford and Son, where they were just junk just about everywhere, and her concern concern was just the equity that she have in her home that when she gets ready to sell, that was an eyesore. So I want to say to you this morning that if you don't care for your heart, and if you don't care for your mind, and if you don't care for your soul, again, as we talked about this bottle, I had it filled with water, I pour some out. If you have all the cares and the concerns, and God doesn't have much, again, have this much space left here for God to fill and to do in our lives, if we don't get to the place where we are empty like this, this is a valuable resource to God. Why? Because now God can fill you with everything and you build up equity in him. In other words, for you to get the equity that God wants to do, you have to do something. You have to empty yourself. The scripture says, if any man should come after me, let him first deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. So we might continue that conversation and talking about that. Again, you build equity by caring for right here and you give God something to work with if he comes to commune with you and your heart is like this and you give him only this much he's going to work with what you give him ultimately we come and we want to be empty so he can fill us with everything that we need let's now get to the matter at hand in that we're going to have a conversation about the church at Pergamos. One of the things that we do here is that when we read the word of God, we ask ourselves the question, what do we know from the text that we read? And here is what we know. Interestingly enough, all the letters written to the seven churches in the book of Revelation opens up with this sense of caution. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit, my God, is saying to this church. That is, I have something to say to you about where you are and what you're dealing with. Can you hear me amidst everything? Can you hear the voice of God amidst everything that you are dealing with and wrestling with at this point? Ah, because you see, God doesn't stop talking to us. He loves us so much, my God, that in spite of whatever it is that we're going through and we're dealing with, he is always there to impart insight and instruction on how to get out of whatever it is you are dealing with. He's always there to strengthen you, but we just have to be at the place where we are attuned tune, not only with the physical here, but we can hear with our heart what the Lord is saying unto us. Like all the churches in the book of Revelation, the church, my God of Pergamos, rather, that should say Pergamos and not Revelation. Thank you for that correction. The church of Pergamos, it was commended for its work. Its opposition is also identified, my God, and the church's response amidst the advers adver adversity is well documented. You see, the church at Pergamos is located in the heat of the battle. Verse 13 expressed that the church is located at the seat of Satan. We're going to talk about this because it's not a 
physical location, but it was just everything that was going on in that uh, location. The church was commended for holding fast to the name of the Lord, and they did not deny, my God, their faith amidst the adversity, the persecution, and even death. I want to ask you the question, because I just feel the sense that I need to provoke you to think about instances and situation and how you responded when you face ad 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 adversity. What was the response that came from you? Was it something where God sits and heaven just applaud you for the response, or was it something that you did where God says, okay, we need to have a Jeremiah chapter number 18 moment here in that we need to put Ian back on the potter's wheel because there are some things inside of him that, my God, I need a fix and I need to work it out again. So the next time he faces this, my God, he will express himself. He will carry himself. He will behave himself in a Christ-like manner. The church at Pergamos, they faced the persecution. They stood tall. Their shoulders were square. They say, do what you want to do because whatever it is that you are going to do, I am not going to deny my faith, but on the other hand, there was something, there was a loophole, there was a weak point, and you see, the enemy knows your weak point, and he knows what's mine, and if we don't take that before the Lord and allow the Lord to strengthen us in those areas that we are weak, the scripture says, brethren, be careful not to present yourself as being strong, because when you are strong, there is that area, my God, that you don't really have uh, 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 an understanding as to how to navigate through this. Why? Because there may be some things that you have gone through that you have not processed and you have not grown through some of the things. So it is just an area of your life that you just push off to the side. And I want to say to you that a chain is strong as its weakest link and if you don't deal with some of those things that are of concern to the Lord that he is talking to you about, then the enemy know where your pressure point is. He know where to push and he know what button to push in order to get on your nerve. God is in control and he wants to fix some of those things that is in your life. The church at Pergamos is commended for standing up in the face of adversity and representing the heart of the gospel message. On the other hand, it is confronted for compromise that it permits. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been there? Where on one hand, you're doing good, but on the other hand, it's one of those things where it's, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's just there. Why? Because you never really dealt or face it and deal with it. And God has been talking to you about it. You see, the church at Pergamos, on one hand, made room for the doctrine of Balaam and Balak and the Nicolaitans to permeate throughout the church, thus becoming a stumbling block, not only for uh, the believers that are there, but also the potential, my God, believers who are looking. I want to say to you that the world is looking at the church and how, uh, how we do things as the church. It will determine if the world even wants anything to do with the church. But when the church find herself in this nebulous place where things are not going that good, God is always calling the church into repentance. And I want to say to you this morning, that if we get to that place where the church, my God, will just fall in our face and just repent before the Lord, then it gives the word an opportunity to say, in spite of the fact they did that, my, 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 they are falling on their face and they decide to turn around. And by you doing so, you then sends the message to the world that is looking to say, just like how we have repented, you too have the opportunity to repent. And you see, when we repent, it puts us in great standing again with the Lord. That's what repentance does. In other words, we turn from the things that we are doing and we turn back to the Lord and we now begin to walk in fellowship with him again. When we become rebellious, we go off on a tangent to do the things that we want to do. God, even though we are in our rebellious state, he continues to talk to us. He continued to commune with us. He continued to send, my God, SOS signal out there to us. An SOS signal is that I am coming to save you out of your situation. 
And you see, the thing is, we have two things that we can do when an SOS signal is sent. We can listen to the message that comes with the signal and we can respond accordingly, or we can continue to just drift and drift. And I want to say, even though you may be drifting and doing, God is still sending a signal. And regardless of how far you are or how far you have gone, David put it this way to us. He said, even if I make my bed in hell, my God, the SOS signal that heaven sends, it will reach and it will get to you. The church is commended to repent. If not, the Lord will show up with the sword of his mouth. Again, the sword points to judgment in scripture. Let me say this to us again, because I think it's important that each time we stand to look at the church, it is important, it is imperative for us to understand the purpose of God's church. Every church, again, that God has created has given it a purpose. A church is then sent into a particular area that has a particular stronghold, and based on that stronghold that is in that particular region, the church is then assigned a purpose and a mission and a mandate to fight against that stronghold. When the church goes into that particular area and it is established, the expectation of the church is that the church follows the mandate given to them and they don't deviate, they don't change, they don't come up with any kind of process improvement to do anything with the exception of what God instructed the church to do, to be, and to become. Again, we look at the book of Matthew when Jesus went into the temple. When Jesus went into the temple again, he went into the temple and uh, to his surprise, not to his surprise, he just walked in there and maybe to their surprise, he walked in there and Jesus' spirit was now cross and he began to walk through the temple and he begins to turn things over and, uh, and loosen things and made whips of the cords and he begins to beat and he begins to drive the individuals out of the church, they look at him and they go, what in the world is wrong with you? Great that you ask me the question, what is wrong with me? Because here is what's wrong with me. My father's house shall be called a house of prayer. But you have made it into a den of thieves. So when we change the intended purpose of the house or the church that God established, people continues to live in bondage and in chain. And the purpose and the mission that God has called us to stand and to represent, when we misrepresent that we've got to look around because there are individuals who are still trapped by those strongholds that are that 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 that, that, that just runs rampant throughout the neighborhood or that place or that region, my God, where the church is established. So we are called to fight against the stronghold. And when we lose sight of the things that God has called us, my God, to do, then those person and those individuals who are trapped and are bound, they continue, my God, to be in that place. Why? Because the church chooses to be rebellious and chooses to march to a different drum and march to a different beat. The seed of Satan is where cult worship took place. It was not physical thing, but it was just everything that was in that region. They were worshiping uh, Caesar. They pay homage to Caesar. They burn incense to Caesar. They would go and they would bow down before and all type of sacrifices were offered and uh, all different type of things that was just repulsive, my God, to the nature and the mind and the attribute of God. And it is in this situation where God placed the church and the church is now aware of the things that are going on. And they have a mission and a mandate to pray to God so that God can nullify and cause the things that are going on in this region to be of no effect. The church starts out and they're doing good. But somewhere along the line, there is a loophole. There's a back door. And the church was not careful to put men and women 
time and places to guard and to watch those back doors. Because you see, every believer who comes into the body of Christ, God has given you a name and he has given you a gift. So when we come together as the church like this, your gifts are, 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 are needed. It is on display. And if God is in need of the gift that he has put in you, he will then speak to your heart in a service like this and say, go do that or go do that. And it is your responsibility to respond to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. You see the scripture talk about putting watchman and watchwoman on the walls, because you see, we need to be keen and we need to be careful. So we watch and look off in the distance. And when we see signs of the enemy approaching or coming close to the church, it is your responsibility and it is mine to sound the alarm. And when the alarm sounds, my God, we have a shut in and we begin to fast and we begin to pray and we wait on the Lord. No wonder the scripture says they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They will mount up with wings as eagle. They will run and not be weary. They will walk and not faint. We have to get to the place and the point, my God, again, where we are built and we're designed like a submarine. Preacher, why would you say that? Because you see, the scripture said that there are higher heights and deeper depths that we have to go. I remember when we were graduating from a ministry school, this thought just uh, uh, came back to me and it was so forceful over the course of this week. Uh, I, I remember the, 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 the professor that uh, uh, talked to us in our final class, he said, God is calling you to go out there and save people who are in the deep. But he said, in order for you to save people who are in the deep, you've got to go below them and you have got to push them up. And then the thought of a submarine just came to my mind. A submarine, again, it has to go deep. It is designed to withstand the external pressure. When the submarine begins to go into the depths of the ocean, the pressure that's on the outside is trying to crush the submarine, if you will. It's kind of like this. You hear it being crushed. But you see, the submarine is designed where there is something on the inside that cancels out the pressure. My God, that is that that is being exhausted on the outside. And the submarine now, it's in a place of stability. It's equilibrium. It's not disrupted. And it can continue to do what it needs to do. This is where our conversation takes place. Because again, if the submarine going down has any weak point, the external pressure that's being exerted, it is going to expose it. And not only will it expose it, everyone on board is on danger. Why? Because there's a weak spot in the submarine. And I want to ask you the question this morning. Do you know what your weak spot is? Do you know what the enemy uses to get you to that place where you quit, you want to give up, and you want to turn around? Let me say this to you before I continue. You see, the enemy is not going to tempt you or test you, my God, with things that you don't like. Because if I don't like uh, <laughs> let me see. If I don't like, uh, if I don't like this, he is not going to use this, my God, to get at me. But if I like this, he is going to bring it in many different variations and many different forms in order to break down my Christian witness. But if I allow the Word of God to build me up on the inside, then he can do what he needs to do because God is going to help me to overcome everything that the enemy will throw at me. My point number one is this, the opposition on the outside and within. Have you ever been there where you're living and you have two fights that you have to fight? You have two battles that, my God, you are wrestling with and you're dealing with on a daily basis. You have to worry about the cares and the concerns outside of the four walls that you live in. And while you're doing that, you have to worry about you because there are these weak spots that is in your life. It is areas of concern. It's conversation that the Lord has have with you, but you ignore and you do absolutely nothing about it. But when you find yourself, my God, being pressured, and when you find yourself is being pressured and the areas in which you are strong, they are reinforced, but there is this one area that you have. And what do you do when you begin to feel the pressure? Just say, do me a favor, son, grab me that. Sorry, I'm right here. 
What do you do when you begin to feel the pressure? I'm going to use this to illustrate this morning. What do you do when you begin to feel the pressure? And as the pressure begins to amount, you pop. But you see, if you allow God to build you in such a way where the pressure is applied and you just go with the flow, if you will, you bend, you bend, and the pressure is being applied, but you bend and you bend. What if you allow yourself this morning to be pliable in the hand of the Lord? My God, look at this. It is being bent. Let me get a different cord so you can see this in this. Look at this. It is pliable. It is being bent. It is being twisted. My God, but it will not break. What if you would allow yourself to become pliable in the hand of the Lord where you're like this, where regardless of how much you are bent, my God, you are contorted. You are crushed on every side, but you are not broken. This morning, my God, that's what we're going to talk about being challenge being tested in all different areas of your life, my God, and you, uh, because you submit and surrender to the will of the Lord, my God, you overcome everything that the enemy throw at you. Watch this. The church of Pergamos faced two different opposition, the opposition within and the opposition on the outside of the walls of the church. The opposition within were those who were willing to live with a compromise of water, of a watered-down gospel misrepresenting the faiths, the precepts, and the commandments of the Lord. The opposition within was not fully committed to the Lord, and thus they were easily moved. When tempted, they made room in their lives for compromise to dictate their response, their actions, their attitudes towards the invitation to compromise. Have you ever been there, my God, where you are living with a compromise? And because you are living with a compromise, the enemy knows that that is your weak spot. If I want to get to him or if I want to get to her, I am just going to visit the area of compromise and I'm going to apply pressure because it's just a matter of time. You see, the enemy hear the conversation we have with the Lord. And if we don't talk with the Lord about the things, my God, thank you, Holy Spirit. If we don't talk with the Lord about the things that are of concern to us, my God, the enemy, my God knows what it is and he is going to apply pressure. Why I say thank you, Lord, what comes to my mind is Job. When you read the book of Job, I think it's in the second chapter and I think maybe verse 11 or so, Job said, the thing that I fear most has come upon me and that which I greatly fear. I have to live now in the reality of it. Why? Because the Bible said that on different season and different times, Time, Job will go up to the house of the Lord and he will offer sacrifice on behalf of his children. Why? He said, just in case they weren't living right, just in case something was not right in their life, I am offering this up as opposed to praying to the Lord. Job turned to an ulterior motive in order to deal with the areas of concern. And I want to say to you this morning and extend an invitation. My God, as the old songwriter said, have a little talk with Jesus. Tell him all about your troubles. He will hear your answer. By just have a little talk with him this morning about the area of concern in your life. Why? Because the area of concern, it is a weak spot and the enemy is going to come and the enemy is going to apply pressure in that area to break down your Christian witness so that you can compromise Job again. He said, the thing that I fear most has come upon me and that which I greatly fear, I am now living in the reality of this. But again, Job was built differently from you and I because when Job realized that everything, my God was being uh, broken down and taken from him, Job realized that I do serve a God that is good and I do serve a God that is gracious. Job again, he shaved his head my God, and he put on sackcloth and ashes, and Job says, I am going to sit and I'm going to wait until my change is come. You see, Job was built like a submarine in that he had, my God, the presence of God living in him. So when he was going through this season, he didn't turn and he didn't blame God. He just stood up and he said, 
God, regardless of what it is that I'm going through, I am not going to deny you. In fact, when you read or study, my God, the life of Job, God was bragging about Job and that Job was built like a submarine. In fact, God says, permit me here just to deviate. I'll get back in a moment. God says this about Job when Satan was going to and fro throughout the land. Have you considered my servant Job? There is none like him in all the earth. And Satan said, oh yeah, give me one round with him. Satan again, he went and he made a pit stop at Job home and he begins to take all the worldly possession. He killed Job, my God, 10 kids. And when he did, Job's faith was still intact. You see, I believe Job was singing one of these good old songs in that my faith has found a resting place, not in device nor creed, but I would forever trust in God. His wounds were shed for me. I need no other argument and I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. Satan took everything that Job had and my God, Job says, naked I come into the world and naked I am going to live. God, I still love you and I I still trust you and I'm not blaming you for everything. God, you made the good, you made the bad. When it's good for me, God, I'm going to celebrate you, God. And when it's indifferent, I'm still going to celebrate you because you see, as long as things does not dictate and control, my God, the worship that flows from you, let the enemy do what he needs to do. But because it's not about the things, but it, 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 it comes down to who lives inside of you. And I want to ask you the question this morning. Morning. Do you have enough of the Lord on the inside built like a submarine so that when the pressure of the world begins to come and want you to compromise, you stand up, you stand tall, and you say, do what you will. You see, when you have enough of the Lord on the inside, you stand Stand up like David and you look at the temptation and the testing and the external pressure and you say, it was good for me that I was afflicted that I might learn. My God, when you have enough of the word of God on the inside, you begin to say to yourself, my God, thy word, oh God, have I hidden my heart that I may not sin against you. Because you see, when you have the word of God on the inside of you and the temptations on the outside begins to come, and want you to acquiesce or give in and to allow certain things to permeate and to come into your life. You see, the first thing that the word of God does with the invitation that is extended from the enemy, he allows you to experience conviction. Conviction is a gift that God has given to the church. But you see, we don't know. We talk about all the other gifts that the church has been given. And just permit me to stay here for a moment God has taken a detour and he is he, he is saying to somebody, I needs must go through Samaria and he is coming to get somebody who is stuck like the woman who is at Samaria. Because you see again, when the church experienced convictions, conviction is a good thing because that's God's way of saying to you, the thing that you are considering and that which you want to do don't do it. The reason you feel the way you do when those invitations are extended and you even turn, you see, you don't have to fully turn. You just have to, even with your eyes and you begin to look over there. The minute you look, you're going to see the Holy Spirit here. And you're having this face-to-face -face conversation with the Holy Spirit. And when you begin to talk with the Holy Spirit, my God, about the reason why you want to go beyond this point, he is saying to you, he's reminding you of who you are. He is reminding you of what is before you. He reminds you of what God has called you out of. He reminds you of what you're getting ready to become because ultimately the conversation doesn't stop here. You can then make the choice to turn and go a different way or you can proceed and go do something that you want to do and you see the thing about it when you go and you do something that you want to do, my God, you have to pass the Holy Spirit and come back this way to get to where he wants to, you to get to. What comes to my mind, I, I just feel like I want to preach because I'm going somewhere to get somebody this morning. When you read First Chronicles chapter number 21, it opens up and it says, and Satan stood up and provoked David to number the tribe of Israel. Preacher, what is wrong with David just numbering the tribe of Israel? Here is what is wrong with this. You see, Israel was under what you call a theocratic government. That is, it is the same government 
government system that you and I are under as a child of God. That is to say they did not do anything unless they get permission and God gave the thumbs up or the green light for them to do this. When Satan stood up in 1 Chronicles chapter number 21 and provoked David to number the tribe of Israel, the Bible tells us that there was a young man who came and he said to him, my Lord, such a thing ought not to be. You see, this person in 1 Chronicles chapter number 21 was a type of the Holy Spirit because you see, as believers, we don't get to that place where we just get up and we just do things just like that. No, no, no. There is a conversation again, my God, that ensues with the Holy Spirit because he is there. He has said, my God, to cause you and I not to do the things that we are going to live and regret later. My, my, I feel your presence this morning. Let me just go here real quick to First Chronicles chapter number 21 because I want to underscore and highlight the name of this young man. First Chronicles chapter number 21 it opens up and it says and satan stood up against israel and provoked david to number the tribe of israel and uh, david said to joab go my god to the ruler of the people and go number the tribe of israel joab was the young man's name that i want to underscore and underline this morning because you see joab he's a type of the holy spirit watch the conversation that joab is now having with david my god when he realized that david is moving in a direction that is conflicting and contrary to God, David has the spot in his life that David did not turn over to the Lord fully, and Satan knows this, and now he begins to apply pressure. You've got to understand that David and the Lord came into some covenant agreement in that God said to David, I want you to build me a house. I'm saying to somebody this morning, be careful of the things that you permit the enemy to use you to do. He's going to use you to self-inflict some wound and to destroy and to separate you from the Lord. Again, when Joab heard what David was going to do, watch this. It says that, and I'm in two here, and David said unto Joab and to the ruler of the people, go number Israel from Beersheba and to Dan and bring me the number of them and my, 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 that I may know it. And Joab answered and said, my God, the Lord make his people a hundred times more, and they be but the Lord, the king. Are, are they not all my Lord? Why doth the Lord require this thing? Why will you, my God, cause trespass to come upon Israel? David, why are you doing this? It is going to lead to your demise. Verse 4, it says, nevertheless, so Joab again is a type of the Holy Spirit. He confronts David over the thing that he wants to do, and he said, don't do it. Don't do it. Watch verse 4. Nevertheless, the king's word prevail over Joab. Wherefore, my God, Joab departed and went through all of Israel and came to Jerusalem. The Bible said that when Joab did this thing, watch verse seven. Let me just read. Let me, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me just minister to you this morning. Verse five. And Joab came and gave the, some of the number of the people to David and all of Israel, that thou, that thou were a thousand thousand and a thousand thousand men that drew sword. And Judah was a hundred, a hundred, four hundred, excuse me, four hundred score and 10,000 men that drew sword. But Levi and Benjamin counted not among them, for the king's word was an abomination unto Joab. Joab said to David, David, don't do this thing. Because if you do this thing, it's going to be displeasing unto the Lord. Watch verse 7. And it says that God was displeased with the thing, therefore he smote Israel. And David said unto God, I've sinned greatly before thee because I have done this thing. But now I beseech thee, take, do, sorry, do away the iniquity of thy servant. For I've done very foolishly. Yes, you have. Because... A conversation was sent to stop you from moving forward. Conviction was experienced. And now, David, you're at the place 
where your countenance is now affected and it is now changed. So the first thing God does is to have a conversation with you and I about the things that he said that we ought not to do. The second thing the, whole, the, 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 the church experience is conviction. Conviction is that uncomfortable feeling. It is that disruptive feeling that you feel on the inside that everything inside of you, it's, 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 just, it's just pulling and it is saying, don't do this. But ultimately we have a choice when we experience conviction. We can satisfy the flesh or we can satisfy the inner man. David chose to satisfy the flesh, just like the church at Pergamum. They experienced conviction. Let me just stay here. I just feel the sense to stay here. Maybe we'll talk about Pergamus later. David has now sinned. David has sinned greatly before the Lord, and the Lord is displeased. And watch this in nine. And the Lord spake unto Gad, David's seer, saying, go tell David, saying, thus saith the Lord, I will offer three things. Choose one of them that I may do it unto thee. Let me say this to you this morning, that there are consequences for the sins that we commit in this life. God has a conversation, we experience conviction and there are consequences that we will face for the sins that we commit in this life. Watch this. So God came, I'm in verse 11 of First Chronicles chapter number 21. We took a detour, we're in Samaria and we're talking with the woman who's at the well because God needs to help you to get this and to understand this. Watch this, verse 11. It says, so God came to David and said unto him, thus saith the Lord, choose thee, either three years famine or three months to be destroyed before your foes, while that the sword of thine enemies overtake thee, or three days, my God, the sword is again, good God Almighty, thank you, Holy Spirit, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Let me read 12 again. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. So David commit this sin. God is holding him accountable because again, there are consequences for the sins that we commit in this life. He says here, either three years of famine or three months to be destroyed before the foes, before thy foes, excuse me, while the sword of thine enemies overtake thee or else three days of the sword of the Lord, even the pestilence in the land and the angel of the Lord destroying my God throughout all the coasts of Israel. Now, therefore, advise thyself, what word shall I bring again to him that sent me? I'm not sure if you've ever been there where you've done something that you like, but you hate what you did? Have you ever been there? Done something that you like, but you hate what you did, why? Because you now have to face and deal with the consequences of a decision. And you don't get to the consequences first without a conversation that the Lord has with you. You don't get to the consequence without experiencing conviction because these are these are the, the, the these are the, the 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 interceptors, if you will, that the Lord has put in place to slow you down and to get your attention not to do what you want to do. David sinned against the Lord. This is the only passage of scripture that you will read, my God, where anybody has committed a sin and they get a choice in what their punishment is. The Lord said to David, because of this thing that you have done, you can turn yourself over into the hands of your enemies. You can permit famine to go through the land, or you can choose the sword, my God, my sword to walk through the land. The very same sword that we talked about, and I thank you, Holy Spirit, 
God is talking to somebody this morning about his judgment in your life. David, again, is given three choices. You can turn yourself over into the ends of your enemies. You can permit three months of famine or three days of God's sword walking through Israel. David, like you, weigh his option. He look at what God presented. David said, God, <clears throat> I can't or I will not turn myself over into the hands of mine enemies because they hate me with or without a cause and they're going to exact revenge and they're going to be merciless. Israel was a warring nation. And because they was a warring nation, they were always fight. People were always fighting against them. So when David looked at option number two, he said, I can't permit us to go through three months of famine because we're going to starve and we won't have any strength to fight our enemies. And when David looked at option number three, David said, God, you are a merciful God. You are a God if I turn my hands, if I turn Israel over into your hands, you will have mercy. And at some point you will hear our cry, even though we have sinned. Maybe that's where you are this morning. Maybe the Lord spoke to you this morning about not doing some things that he had a conversation with you about. You experience conviction. And three, the consequences of your action is before you. And he's saying, choose. David looked and David reasoned. And when David reasoned, David said to God, I want you to go back to the Lord. And I want you to let him know that this is the choice that I have made. I'm going to read the word of God. That's what we're doing. He said he wanted to have a conversation with us this morning. So I'm just getting out of the way and just let him talk to my God who he needs to talk to this morning. Verse 11. So Gad came to David and said unto him, thus saith the Lord, choose thee either three years of famine, three months to be destroyed before thy foes, or three, month, three days of the sword of the Lord going through Israel. And David said to Gad, I am in great strain. Because you see, this is what disobedience and rebelliousness do to the church when we function and operate. There is this uneasiness that we feel on the inside because we know that that which we have done, it is wrong. And David said unto Gad, I am in great strain. Let me fall now into the hands of the Lord. For very great are the mercies. But let me not fall into the hands of man. So the Lord, verse 14, so the Lord sent pestilence on Israel, and there fell in Israel 70,000 men. Think about this. The consequences of your action and mine to not to allow conviction to bring us to that place of safety, but rebelliousness bring us to that place of destruction. As a result of David's decision to be disobedient, 70,000 men have lost their lives. Think about this, if you will. As a result of your disobedience, not to follow the instruction that God has given unto you and unto me, how many persons have died? And maybe you're saying this morning, they have not died physically, but how many people have died spiritually as a result of your disobedience? Hmm. As a result of David's disobedience, to number the tribe of Israel, 70,000 men lost their lives. But it gets better. Watch this. Hmm. Verse 15, and God sent an angel unto Jerusalem to destroy it. And as he was destroying, 
the Lord beheld and he repented him of the evil and said to the angel that was destroyed, it is enough. It is enough. Stay thine hand. And the angel of the Lord stood by the threshing floor of Onan, the Jebusite. And David lifted up his eyes and saw the angel of the Lord standing between the earth and the heaven, having a sword drawn in his hand stretched out over Jerusalem. Then David and the elders of Israel, who were clothed in sackcloth, fell on their face. You see, this is what the Lord is talking to us about there in the book of Revelation, chapter number two. It's about repentance. It's acknowledging that that which you have done is wrong, and you fall on your face, kneel in contrition, you come before the Lord, and you ask him to forgive you. I'm coming after somebody this morning. Verse 17. And David said unto God, it is not that I have commanded the people to be numbered, even I. It is that I've sinned and done evil indeed. But as for these sheep, what have they done? Let thine hand, I pray thee, O Lord my God, be upon me. And upon my father's house, and be not on thy people, that they should be plagued. And the angel of the Lord, and the angel of the Lord commanded Gad to say to David that David should go up and set up the altar unto the Lord in the threshing floor of Honan the Jebusite. And David went up saying, and David went up at the saying of Gad, which he spake in the name of the Lord. And Onan turned back and saw the angel and his four sons with himself, with, and his four sons rather, with him hid themselves. Now Honan was threshing wheat. And as David came to Onan, Onan looked and saw David, went up and went out rather of the threshing floor and bowed himself to David with his face to the ground. And David said to Onan, grant me, please, grant me rather the place of thy threshing floor that I may build an altar therein unto the Lord. My God, thou shalt grant it to me for full price that the plague may stay away from the people. And Onan said to David, take it thee. Let my Lord, the king, do with it that which is good in his sight. Lo, I gave thee ox and also burnt offering and the threshing floor and the wood and the wheat and the meat offering I will give thee. And David said unto Onan, no. No. I have done wrong and I have to pay for the sins that I've committed. David was offered an easy way out. Just by virtue of him being king, Onan realized it's David. David needed this plot of land. Israel is in trouble because of something that David did. Onan said, take the threshing floor, take the ox and everything you need to do in order to offer a sacrifice so that God can turn this thing around. And David said, no, I want to pay for that which I've done, which is wrong. And King David said to Onan, no, I'm in verse 24, but I will verily buy it for full price. For I will not take that which is thine for the Lord and offer burnt offering without a cost. It is going to cost you something. A conversation, conviction, a choice, consequences, cost. It starts with a conversation with the Lord. 
Whenever the thing pops up on your radar, that weak area, that area of compromise in your life, it starts with a conversation. The Lord allow you to experience conviction to tell you that you need to do something about this. When you don't, you experience the consequences of it. You do get a choice in it. And now David said, because I did this thing, I, I, I own it, I, I, I'm going to pay the full price for my sins that I've committed. I'm going to pay full price for this. So David gave to Onan for the place, 600 shekels of gold by weight. And David built an altar and offer burnt offering and peace offering and called on the name of the Lord and answer him. Sorry, David, let me read that again. Verse 26. And David built there an altar unto the Lord and offer burnt offering and a peace offering and call upon the name and call upon the Lord. And the Lord answer him from heaven by the fire upon the altar. And the Lord commanded the angel and he put his sword again into the sheep. At that time, when David saw the Lord and answer him in the threshing floor of Onan the Jebusite, then he sacrificed there. For the tabernacle of the Lord, which Moses made in the wilderness, and the altar of the burnt offering, where at that season was high, was in the high places of Gibeon. But David could not go before to inquire of the Lord, for he was afraid because the sword of the angel of the Lord. I don't know who this morning the Lord took that detour in order to say to you, he started out with a con conversation with you. He allowed you to experience conviction. You went and you made a choice. You have to live with the consequences of your decision. And it is going to cost you something to get back into his good grace. David said to Ona, I'm going to pay full price for this, for what I've done. Let me say this to you looking ahead and just share this about the life of David. Again, God and David had... A conversation here and he said David when you get here that is you come here I want you to build me a house I want you to build me a house you see there are things that we do in our Christian walk and we don't understand the impact the negative impact of some of the things that we do as a child of God. Sir, I've got a mic that is open. Can you mute that for me, sir? We have the things that we do. God has some conversation with us here. And he says, when you move from here and you get to here, there are some things that I want to partner with you and I want to do. But because of the things that we do in the in-between, we disqualify ourselves from doing some things for the Lord. David was supposed to build a house for the Lord. And when it came time for that house to be built, the Lord said to David, you can't build this house for me. I love you, but you can't build this house. Why can't I build this house for you? David, because you've got blood on your hands. And I can't use your hands to build me this house. You will continue to do for me. But I can't allow you. I can't permit you, David, to do this thing. I'm not sure who God took the detour and come to Samaria to see. You see, Samaria was that place where there was a woman who was there. This woman had no friend, live in isolation. Relationships, there was an issue with relationship. The female relationship weren't working. The male relationship weren't working. The relationship with her community weren't working. The relationship with the Lord weren't working. She just had a major issue with relationship. 
Jesus and his disciple had made plans to go minister. And in the middle of all of that, he said, I need months go through Samaria. And when he went, he met this woman that was lonely, isolated, all by herself. And he begins to have a cathartic conversation with her, a deep conversation about the area of compromise and the area that needs to be addressed. Like David, like this woman, like you, like me, that's what the Lord is doing this morning. Having a conversation with you, with me, the church at Pergamos, we'll see if he wants us to talk about that next week. Because you see, if we don't fix those areas of compromise, again, when the enemy begins to apply pressure, it should be that we are bent like this, but not broken. But you see, when the enemy begins to apply pressure, we break. And I wonder who this morning have felt the pressure of the enemy. And not only have you felt the pressure of the enemy, but you see, there is something, I'm still here preaching, there is something about pressure being applied externally. And I want you to hear when this thing begins to crackle just before it breaks. Listen. Because you see, there are some telltale signs that you have reached your breaking point. There are some telltale signs that if the pressure continues to be applied, it's just a matter of time. David find himself in this situation where First Chronicles 21 says, Satan stood up. Know this, if you will. And I'm going to pray after this. Read it for yourself. Satan stood up against Israel. Satan stood up against Israel. Grab your Bible, and we're going to read this together. I want you to read this. I want you to see it. The Lord is talking to somebody this morning. Let me bring this close and show it to you. Satan stood up against Israel, stood up against Israel, stood up against the church. And because he stood up against Israel, because he stood up against the church, the Bible now said that he provoked David to do something that is going to further set the church back. I wonder who this morning as the enemy is using to provoke, to set God's church his mission and his mandate back. Because you see, you have to be mindful of the invitation that the enemy extends. And you've got to be at that place where you say no. Say a no to the things that you like, because the things that you like, it may cost you. Father, 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 we come before you this morning. You said you wanted to have a conversation with us, and that's what you did. You took a detour in order to show us the condition and the state of our own heart. You talked with us, oh God, about doing something that we liked and we wanted to do. At the end of it, God, we hated ourselves for doing what we did. It's kind of like what the scripture says in that it says, there's a way that seemeth right unto a man. But the end thereof are the ways of death. All the ways of a man are clean in his or her own eyes. And I pray this morning, God, for each and every one of us who may find ourselves in a situation like David, where again, Satan stood up against the church, an idea, things that you wanna implement and you wanna do. And Satan has now provoked me to do something that is going to further delay the deliverance, of somebody in my home, maybe my next door neighbor, maybe in my community, 
maybe in the state that I live, maybe in the country that I live, maybe in this world. God, because what he asked me to do felt right. I begin to move in the direction to do it. But God, I thank you for the Joabs of this world, which is a type of the Holy Spirit. Because now Satan stood up against Israel, provoked David to do the same. Joab then intercepted and have a conversation with, jo with, with David. And say, my king, don't do this thing. Don't. Because there are consequences to your action. David, like us, experienced conviction. And because our conviction that we experience, we have a choice with the conviction that we experience. We can take a step back, realign ourselves with you, and continue, or we can, we, can, we can push the conviction out of the way and move and do something. And when we do that, God, we are now living with the consequences of the actions that we allow to run through our body or to take place in our lives. We now have a second conversation with you. And God, you present choices before us. David realized that, God, I can't turn myself over into the hands of the enemy. God, I can't allow famine to take place in my life at this season. God, I think I'm going to stick with you because I have known you to be a merciful God. Maybe that's where we are this morning, God, where we have turned ourselves back over into your hands, asking for you to exact judgment. The sword in scripture, again, it points to judgment. Maybe that's where somebody is this morning. Maybe. Maybe. But I come this morning, God, and I'm just asking you to have mercy this morning. Have mercy upon me, have mercy upon my brother, have mercy upon my sisters. Mm. Have mercy, Jesus. Because of the decision that David made, 70,000 men lost their life. David now has to live with the blood of 70,000 men on his shoulders because of his disobedience. Father, I just pray this morning for those souls that are out there that are still out there in an extended wilderness stay because of our disobedience. I pray this morning, God, that you will send somebody, my God, to go free them, set them free. And I pray, oh God, just like David repented, we will understand the consequences of our action. We will understand our rebelliousness. And we will fully repent, knowing that it's going to cost us something. But I pray this morning that if nothing else gone, the rebelliousness that we carried and have lived with and have used to justify our actions, I pray this morning, God, that it will be far separated as the east is from the west. Spirit of the living God, as David would have prayed and looked and saw the angel and realized, oh God, that you have accepted the sacrifice that was offered. Why? Because he paid full price. David wasn't making any deals. David said, I did this and it is wrong. I am going to pay the full price. Maybe somebody this morning just need to have an honest conversation with you and said, God, I did this thing and it was wrong. And I repent. I'm not making any excuses. I'm not blaming anybody. This morning, Lord, I did this thing and it is wrong. Maybe this is the morning or the afternoon where we have a honest conversation with you, folks. 
and because we're having this honest conversation with you, you can then cause the judgment, the sword, to be placed back in its sheath. And we can continue with you. Spirit of the living God, thank you for this conversation that you have selected to have with us, your sons and your daughters. And I pray, oh God, that we will accept your forgiveness. We will accept our responsibility in the path that we play. And we will stand up and dust ourselves off. This time around, God, we will go and do everything that you have called us to do with no reservation. No reservation. Father, we thank you. We praise, we glorify, we honor and we celebrate you lifting the burden from us. Now I understand why you started out with this. Because when we become like this, all the stuff that was inside of us, God, it has to go. So when we become like this, you can fill us with everything we need for our tomorrow. We thank you and we say thank you. Thank you for the time in Jesus' name we pray, man. Thank you for the time that you have spent just sitting and allowing the Lord to minister to you the way in which he did. Definitely has ministered to me. I had no idea <laughs> that I was going to read the entire passage of First Chronicles chapter number 21. But that's how it is when you submit to the Lord. Your submission and your obedience to the Lord is the key that unlocks somebody's prison door. So I'm gonna encourage you this morning to take a second look at the word of God. Sit and read First Chronicles chapter number 21 for yourself and allow God to minister to you through. And as you read it, let the word of God read you Again, he shared these five points, and I hope I can remember it. So again, God starts with a conversation. We experience conviction. There are choices that we have to make when we face the conviction. There are consequences that we have to deal with. And then it is going to cost you something. It is going to cost you. Your disobedience costs you something. We love you here from a new creation. You do have the opportunity where you can give back your tithes and your offerings. So Wesley will bring that information up. Again, we thank you. I'm grateful that the Lord chose me and us here to share his word so his word can have its rightful place in your life. And I just pray as we conclude the service, I'm just at a place in the Lord where I'm coming down from where I was. So if I seem a little bit um, fragmented, just pray for me. I'm, I, when I get through here, I'm just going to kneel and fall on my face and I'm just going to pray. My prayer is that we will get back in line with God. We will. And let him do what he wants to do in your life. God bless you. We love you. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. We don't conclude service. We're going to have music that we still play. And the whole intent of that is to continue the conversation that the Lord started with you in service. And by you doing so, you give him a place to even work further in your life. God bless you. And we love you here from a new creation, from my house to yours, from my heart to yours. My prayer is that God will bless, keep, guide, protect, lead, direct, strengthen and encourage as you surrender to him. Surrender your all. The old songwriter said, I surrender all, all to thee, my blessed savior. I surrender all. God bless you and thank you.